say, my heart is open to receive the word of God. Speak to me, God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the title of my message today is the, the Honor Protocol. And when we talk about protocol, let me tell you that in life most things have to be learned. And we keep learning so many things. Uh, I, I was uh, out there in the West uh, during the week and I attended this big conference. Then I went to one of the big PAOC churches in Edmonton to, uh, to take a course on leadership. Then I was preaching in another church. And I noticed that over there, uh, people don't even bring Bibles to the church. It's just iPads <laughs> and phones and all these things. And we see them around. We know we touch and they do stuff, right? But we need to learn them. And uh, I think one of the reasons why uh, this is taking off so quickly is because it's so easy to use. I mean, you start, you know, moving around and you learn and say, Oh, I can have my books, I can have all these things. And we learn about all these things. But in life, we learn also uh, protocol or ethics. And uh, I would like first to, to talk about the protocol or the, the ethics of honor. Because uh, as, I, as we grow up, uh, we see changes in society. And parents will teach their children different things. Uh, the education I had was a little bit tougher than the one I gave to my kids. And I guess with my parents was the same thing. So we kind of, as a society, we're downgrading in what regards to respect and, uh, and honor. But uh, let me tell you, in God's kingdom, if you expect God's blessings, you need to start honoring God and respecting God, respecting His word, and uh, understand that God is holy. This, this is a holy place. Even though we talk loud and we have drums and we do certain things that some other churches will not do, we're not, we don't mean to be disrespectful to God. God is the creator of life. And, and God loves uh, uh, as, we, as we manifest that life. You know, the, when the little children were coming to Jesus, the disciples were telling them, no, no, you cannot bother the, the master. But Jesus said, you don't understand. Let the little ones come to me. And he had fun with them because this is the nature of God. God is not a rigid God. Sometimes we create these ethics and protocols. And let me talk a little bit about it today. Now, if you go to a fancy place like a, a five-star uh, restaurant, you need to dress accordingly. And when I mean five star, it's not the five star in Acapulco or in the Bahamas. Well, in the Bahamas it's a bit different. Because if you went to five stars hotels in holidays, it's something. But if you go, let's say, to Monte Carlo, to a five star, or to Madeira Island, or some of these places, there's really a rigid protocol. You don't get in in shorts. You don't get in, uh, you know, just as, as I'm dressed today. You need the, the, the specific attire to enter into those places. Otherwise, you're stopped at the door. And, and some, someone will tell you, excuse me, lady or gentleman, you're not properly dressed in, uh, to enter into our club, into our restaurant, into our facility. So there's a specific proto protocol or a specific dress code to certain places. Now, in terms of church and our relationship to one another and to God, there's also a protocol. And, and the, the things we do now at church are different from the things the early church did. They're different from the things that Martin Luther uh, did during, uh, uh, you know, some centuries ago. They're very different from the church in the 60s or in the 80s because as a society we evolve. But uh, as we have an evolution in, in terms of what we do, we cannot lose of sight the honor and the respect that the things of God deserve. Not only the things of God, but also as people, we need to learn how to honor one another. Now, if, if, the same way you need the proper protocol in order to enter into a fancy place. If you want to be blessed by God, there are certain things we need to learn. You know, I had to teach my kids when they were little. And they, they did all sorts of things like any other kid. They didn't have respect, they were selfish, they, they were not willing to share. So they, I had to teach my kids, you know, this is not the proper way to behave. We do like this. 
And, and that's in, in my house. I don't correct other people's kids, but certain times, uh, man, sometimes I, I see the way people treat their kids, and I think, well, if you were my kid, you, know, you wouldn't do, be doing that, that stuff or showing that disrespect. I, I don't know if you know what I mean. It's not that I was really rigid with my children, but I, I didn't allow behavior like I see in some kids today. And as Christians, we need to understand the code or the ethics of the family, the code of, and the ethics of the church, and also how to approach God. That's really important. Because you don't approach God like you approach uh, anything uh, common. And uh, when we talk about uh, honor, let me read this uh, scripture in Proverbs chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read from the, the Amplified Bible. And, uh, and it says, Be not wise in, uh, in your own eyes. Reverently fear and worship the Lord and turn entirely away from evil. It shall be help to your nerves and sinews and marrow and poisoning to your bones. And then verse 9, honor the Lord we are with your capital and sufficiency from righteous labors and with the first fruits of all your income. So shall your storage places be filled with plenty and your vats shall overflow with new wine. So what we see here is a command, not just an advice, to honor the Lord. And he talks about reverent fear. What is this reverent fear? It's that respect that God deserves. And respect and honor is seen by the way we act. When we honor, we, we give. And this is why it says, it doesn't say give offerings to the Lord. It says honor the Lord with your first fruits. And many of us do this. I do this. It's a practice in my family and something that I, I, I'm teaching to my children. I started to teach them when they were very young. When you receive something, you honor God for, with the first fruits. And first fruits, uh, usually we give one tenth of our first fruits to the Lord. It's a way of honoring God. It's a way of, of telling God, God, I put you in a high place. But just like honor, it's a very important thing, and, and honor elevates things. You see, when you honor people, when you honor God, everything is elevated as we honor people. Dishonor, on the contrary, brings everything in the down spiral. When you don't honor authorities, when you don't honor a government, when you don't honor a, a, a leader, a boss, when you don't honor your wife or your husband, Everything comes down in the down spiral. The atmosphere gets heavy. There's an atmosphere of disrespect, of offense, because of lack of honor. Because when you don't have honor, then you give room to offense. Now let me move a little bit further uh, on this concept. And many people today expect to be blessed without honoring God. Uh, and uh, uh, that some others expect to be healed physically, emotionally, without having a reverent fear of God. So if you don't fear God, if you don't have this reverence for the Lord, if you don't bring honor to God, uh, uh, this will not happen. And this is something that doesn't happen naturally. I mean, when you accept the Lord, you don't know how to approach Him. And then we teach the code or protocol of honor. Now with some churches, it's something external. The church where I was brought up, uh, it was a church where you couldn't talk loud uh, in church. You know, you had to be silent. And if you passed in front of an altar, you had to kneel and you had to do a sign of a cross. And there was certain things you could do, you couldn't do. And if we went outside of those external behaviors, it, it was bad. And we will be correct. Now, I'm not telling that that's a wrong thing to do. You know, each church has a culture, and our church also has a culture. I'm not saying that's incorrect, but where we need really to respect God is in our heart. It starts in our heart. The reverent fear of God starts here. It's not just what we do. Because, you see, God can, can see inside of your heart. And certain people, they just show fear of God with their uh, exterior things, but inside 
they couldn't care the less about God. God is not a priority. See, when we honor, we have priorities. Now, uh, certain churches will, will do uh, different things like uh, burning incense and doing all these sorts of things. That's their protocol of honor. It's the way they have to show honor. And they do all sorts of things. This is a Coptic priest, by the way. And, and it's very important during their service what they do with the incense. And everybody looks at the priest as the priest uh, puts incense everywhere. And, uh, you know, uh, to me it doesn't make much sense if I come here and I put incense in, in the air because uh, it, it's not my code of honor. Maybe it's not yours. Uh, you know, if I want to honor my wife, imagine if I, if I spread incense or if I take up a spray and I, and I you know, she will be even offended. I will, I'm not going to do anything like this. So we have different protocols of honor. And so there's uh, churches that develop these uh, different kinds of behaviors and things uh, with their traditions and they repeat these prayers and they kneel down and today I want to tell you that I'm not here to devalue or disrespect what other churches do but I'm here to teach you what the Bible says about honoring God which is more than lighting a candle kneeling down or doing these things it starts with your daily life and this is why God says if you want to honor me start by honoring me with the first fruits of what I give you start by honoring me so putting your money where your mouth is. And you see, it, it's very easy to say, oh, I love God. But then when it, it touches the area of our wealth, we think twice. And we think, well, I have so many good things to do. Why should I bother in buying New Testaments for the neighbors? Let them go and buy them, uh, themselves. No, we, we honor God through our offerings, through what we do. Now let me go a little bit further. And let's go to the, the Old Testament. And this is uh, very easy to find, very easy to find, it's, uh, if you go to the middle of your Bible and you move uh, from the book of Matthew, the New Testament, the book before is the book of Malachi. And a friend of mine told me this is the Italian prophet, Malachi, but uh, <laughs> it's not Italian, so he was actually, it's not Malachi that you read, it's Malachi. And uh, uh, the, the book of Malachi uh, happened, this happened in the year 550 uh, BC. And society was bad. Things were going in a down spiral. You know, they, they were uh, in, in financial crisis. They were in crisis with their neighbors. There was poverty. Uh, the, 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 the temple, the temple was practically destroyed. It was a bad time. And God raised a prophet named Malachi. And Malachi asked about the honor that is due to God. So let, let's read this uh, first verse again on the Amplified Bible. Malachi 1.6. It says, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is the reverent fear due to me? Says the Lord of hosts. O priests who despise my name. You say, how and in what way we have despised your name? And then it continues. You see, God is asking honor and he's saying, you owe me. Honor. You owe me. You know you owe God honor. You don't do a special favor when you lift up your hands during worship and you say, God, I, I love you. I want to give you honor. This is what we do during praise and worship. Praise and worship, it's not the warm up for the preaching. Praise and worship. We don't start, you know, sometimes we think, well, let's do a quick song and then another song and then, and then let's lift up our hands and then the praise and worship leader says, now let everybody, let's lift up our hands. And do you know why we have to do this? It's because so many times people forget that we're in God's presence. They're thinking about lunch, bills to pay, how hot it is, how cold it is outside. The brakes that have to be changed and the tires that have to be changed. And what am I going to do now because I'm missing my favorite show? Should I buy a TiVo? And it's all sorts of weird thoughts that go around. Instead of just saying, slow down, soul. And now my soul, I command you, you're going to praise the Lord. And when you praise the Lord, yes, you lift your hands. It's a sign of manifestation of worship. And yes, you clap. Let's clap our hands. Let's clap our hands to the Lord. We're not clapping the person or the individual. We're here when we do an applause. 
We're giving honor to God. Amen. See, when I go to, to a, a soccer game or if I go and watch the impact and they scored two goals this week, it was awesome. And they score and everybody's cheering up and saying, yay! And they're happy for the players. Over here, when we clap, we're showing our appreciation and our honor to the Lord. Yes. Of course, we also show to people. And sometimes, we have amazing singers here. The prison worship bands that we have, they're, they're awesome. And we say, let's give a, a, a clap offering to the band. And some people say, oh, we don't honor people. Yes, we do. We honor the band. And they deserve honor. Our ushers, people that are downstairs with the children. You know, some people, you know, see this as, a, as just a burden having to do things in the church. It's not a burden. It's a privilege. It's an honor to serve the Lord. And, and you know what? We honor those people that are here to greet us. We honor when we have someone to greet us in the parking lot. And there's praise and worship music in the parking lot. And the, and the steps are clean. And we, we want to praise all of you and give you honor when you serve the Lord like this. But God is saying, I deserve honor. Yes. And you say, in what way have we despised your name? Because you see, even the priests <coughs> thought they were honoring God, but they weren't. So God had to bring correction. And many times we need to be corrected in the way we worship. Now, let me show uh, this uh, train station. My wife is looking at the station and she's thinking, where did he got that picture? Uh, it's a little bit dark, but actually I lived in the building which is on the other side of this little train station. It's a train station. And uh, at the right there's a beautiful mountain. It's a, it's, a, it's a gorgeous place. It's a beautiful place. And we lived in that building. You know, we, in a, the, our apartment was awesome. It faced the mountain. We opened the door and the mountain was there. There was a little inconvenient. At 6 a.m. A train will stop here, and there, there was a, a road right there, and we had, you know, those red lights flashing, and, and the bell. Bing, 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 and then the train will come, and sometimes they were electrical, but some, the, uh, when we went there, certain trains were not electrical, were diesel. So we will hear the locomo locomotive coming and stopping, and, and when we got the apartment, and the first night there, we had the first night there, we said, man, we did a big mistake. <laughs> this is awful. How am I going to sleep now? And it was around 5.30, 6 a.m. Then 7 a.m. because it was rush hour, and they had to go to the big city, which is, uh, you know, 40 kilometers far away. And, and here we are in an apartment, which is awesome. Our son David was uh, just a baby. And he had just born, and I was a pastor there in that place, and we had to live with a train station. It was horrible. But guess what? After a few months, I think two months, I could hear the train. I, I didn't hear the train. I was sleeping. The train was passing. I was sleeping like a baby. 5 a.m. Then I will hear after I, I wake up, because I, I, I got used to the train. I couldn't hear the train. And when we had guests, they came to our house and we showed the window and said, look at the beautiful mountain. And then a train will come. We said, how can you live here? I said, what do you mean? There's a train. And we said, we cannot hear the train. <laughs> we got used to it. We, you know, we had double windows and all that. It wasn't enough. But after a while, it's like the train wasn't there. Where am I going with this? We can get used to the things of God. And we come to church. And we do all things that we do in church. We greet one another. We show our accident, our Colgate smiles. <laughs> How are you? We try to look great. You know, we, we do our best. So we, we cover up, you know, anything that is going on. Maybe you are in the car, but you left the parking lot and now you need to smile. And you do all things like you do in church. You lay, lift up your hands and you clap and you give your offering. But you can ignore God. You can ignore that God is here 
to speak to your life. You can be so used to the things of God that you just ignore the respect and the reverence that He deserves. Amen. This was happening in the time of Malachi and everything was going down. Now, let me read now on the, on the message uh, and on verse, uh, same chapter, but verse 11 to 13. And I chose this translation because I really like the way uh, it's, it's, uh, it's um, it worded. And it says, verse 11, I am honored all over the world. And there are people who know how to worship me all over the world. Who honor me by bringing their best to me. They are saying it everywhere. God is greater. This God of the angel armies. All except you. Instead of honoring me, you profane me. You profane me when you say worship is not important. And what we bring to worship is of no account. And when you say, I'm bored, this doesn't do anything for me. You act so superior, sticking your noses up in the air. I like this translation. <laughs> oh, and it continues. Superior to me, God of the angel armies. And when you do offer something to me, it's a uh, head me down, or broken, or useless. Do you think I'm going to accept it? This is God speaking to you. I still remember... One of the churches I planted in downtown Toronto, and we had this huge place, it was about twice this, the size of this church, uh, right downtown Toronto. And we, uh, we were trying to decorate the place the best we could, and this lady came to me and said, Pastor, I have something here, I don't use it anymore, I was going to throw this, this away, but uh, here it is, some plastic flowers to put in the altar. And I looked at the plastic flowers and said, no way I'm going to put this in the altar. I didn't want to offend the lady, but I, I had to rebuke her. And I said, thank you for the plastic flowers. I'll find a place for it. But we don't put used stuff in the altar or cheap stuff in the altar. Because our God deserves the best. Amen? Amen. And here is God saying, you say you honor me, but you don't bring offerings to me. You don't give me anything that shows your appreciation. And when you do it, it's like a hand-me-down. Here. You know, oh, offering time again. Here it goes. You know, things should be free. I mean, university education should be free. <laughs> no, this is so sad. <laughs> You know, we have students now, they want free education. Good for them. I want free education too because I already pay so much in taxes, it should be free. Right? <laughs> Looking at me. But nothing in, in this world is free. So if you have to pay for it, what can you do? When you come to the church, you don't have to pay for it. It's not a matter of paying. You don't pay tithes. I just don't like when people say, I pay my tithes. You don't pay anything. When you pay, you're purchasing something. You honor God. And when you honor God with your first fruits, then certain things start to happen. Then there's healing in the land. God said, you know, let's go, uh, I know we always, I, I don't want to mention just the, the, this aspect of offerings, but then on, on chapter, uh, chapter 3, where is it? Here. Chapter 3 and verse 7, and we all know this scripture. It says, even from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from me my ordinances, and I have not kept them. Return to me, and I will re return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? So you see, the whole book, it's about honor. About honoring God. And God is saying, you owe me. Because you're not doing the right thing. And then verse 8, it says, Will a man rob or defraud God? Yet you rob and defraud me. But you say, in what do we rob or defraud you? You have withheld your tithes and offerings. It doesn't say you stop giving. But it said you have withheld. You know, see, it's like some people, they say, hmm. I don't like this pastor, so I'm not giving my offerings. I'm putting them on the piggy bank, 
And when there's someone that here that I like, I'll give it to the Lord. You know what you're doing? You're withholding the honor that God deserves. Ouch. <laughs> that hurts. I'm here to speak the truth. And then God says, you are cursed with a curse. You are robbing me, the whole nation. So they made this a habit. They said, well, the economy is so bad. You know, we need to pay to the Romans. We pay tax to Caesar. We, we need to pay taxes to, to the, this evil king. We need to do all these things. We don't have enough now to, to give to God. And God says, you are robbing me. You're not robbing the priests. You're not robbing the church. And then he says, bring your all tithes, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and prove me. Now by, by it, says the Lord of hosts, I will not, if, if I will not open the windows of heaven, or the floodgates of heaven, for you, and pour out a, a blessing, that there shall be no room enough to receive it. Amen. Praise God. Thank you for that applause. <laughs> and you can applaud if you're doing this. Otherwise, you feel offended. Otherwise, this is a message that will offend you deeply. Because you think, I pay for so many things, and now I come to church, and they still talk about money. These pastors want my money. Listen, if I wanted money, I wouldn't be a pastor. <laughs> If I wanted money, I had better ways to get money than being a pastor. Believe me. We teach the church, it's not because the pastors want money. It's because we want you to have more money. We want you to prosper. We want you to be blessed and understand the protocol of honor, which is we honor God with our lives. That's what's important. But when you, you honor God with your lives, you bring an offering. It's like if you have a, a birthday, or an anniversary, or something, or a wedding, you honor with your offering. And sometimes you don't want to do it. You say, oh, here we go to the wedding. <laughs> How much are you going to give? <laughs> well, I'll say 200 bucks. Well, you know, it's a fancy Italian thing, so we better give 300. All right. And, and now we need to give more. Oh my God. Oh, well, you no, know, we should have said that we're in holidays. We should, we should have given an excuse. We're going to, to do all this stuff. <laughs> and we forget that we're not paying, we're honoring. We're honoring that people. And if we have that attitude, you sow those $500 on that couple that, that is about to get married, or $1,000, or whatever, and you feel happy with yourself. Because you know that you're doing above your best, and you're honoring those folks. Why don't we do the same thing in the things of God? God called us to be vessels of honor. And there's vessels for honor and for dishonor. What kind of vessel are you? That's just a question. And uh, so we, we see how God was telling them. And, and listen, on the same passage, listen to what they were saying. They're saying, church is boring. I'm bored. Have you ever heard people saying, I'm bored? Have you ever been bored at church? I have. I have. I, I confess. I've been in church services and I say, I'm so bored. When is it over? Can we go home now? Say, wife, you have the car keys? <laughs> You know, let's go home. I'm so bored. I hope you're, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, bringing boredom to you today. But they were saying worship was boring, church was a drag, everything was going down and down and down because of the lack of honor. And God is just saying, you know, that honor will elevate them, but dishonor will bring everything down. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 8, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So we can honor God with lip service. But what about the practicality of things? And when I'm saying honoring God, it's not about money. Listen, it's your service. It's your service. See, some people told me, oh, I would love to go to church, but you, you know what? Uh, I, I make $25 uh, an hour, and if I skip 
my job to go to church, I'm going to lose 50 bucks. Really? I'm telling you, you're losing a lot more than 50 bucks. You're losing maybe even your salvation. Honoring God includes honoring the prophets. Look what Jesus said. Matthew 15, uh, 13, 57. And they say, and they took offense at him. They took what? Offense. offense. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in, in his own uh, household. That's the words of Jesus. So I'm standing here today as a prophet. And I should know that I don't have honor here in this house. Now you're looking at me. Why am I saying this? I know I have honor from those that are God-fearing and obey the Lord. But those that are in sin, that don't honor God, they will not honor the prophets of God. This is really silent because you're really paying attention. When Jesus preached, they were always trying to find a way to find fault in what He said. Let's see if He has the right doctrine in this. Let's see. And then at the end they will get together. You know, He said this, this and this. I think this goes against the book of Isaiah. I think this goes against Jeremiah. Let's try to get him in something. This was Jesus. If you're serving the Lord, you're not greater than Jesus like I'm not greater than Jesus. And Jesus said, if they did this to the master, they will do this to you. So I will not be surprised if I preach the word of God here and if I don't get honor. But I'm not preaching to get honor. I'm preaching that God will get the honor. But there's something very important. Before you clap, there's something very important. If you don't honor those that serve the Lord, how can you honor God? If you cannot honor those that you see, how can you honor the invisible God? When you go and have your children downstairs, if you don't honor the Sunday school teachers that are there giving of their time and their lives to serve the kids, how are you going to honor God? If you argue with an usher because he asks you to move from this place to another place, and you argue with the usher and say, this is, has been my place for 20 years, stuff like this. You know, that's a lack of honor. You no know, respect. Respect people. And look that they, take, they took what? Offense. Because when you don't honor, you're offended. You say, Pastor, I'm really offended with you. Why are you offended with me? Because you've said this, this, and this. And then I say, okay, let's check the Bible. You're lying. You're deceiving. You're raising false accusations. You're doing all these things. Here's the word of God. I'm offended with you. No, that's... You know, everything we do in life, we need to do it with the right attitude. I'm accountable to God and to you. I'm not in the business of offending people. But many times, people feel offended with pastors, preachers, you know, with counselors, because their lives don't bring honor to God. Because if you honor God, and if you honor others, your life will be elevated. That's when you get that promotion. Then that's when you get that miracle. That's when you understand that God is with you always. That's when you die and you actually see the floodgates of heaven instead of a curse. Because some people say, I'm tithing, but it seems that I'm under a curse. No wonder are you bringing honor to God or are you paying tithes? Because if you pay, there's no honor. It's like that gift for the wedding that you say, oh, 100 bucks. There's no honor in that. Are you following me? Okay, don't get upset with me. Jesus was seen as the son of the carpenter by his fellow people. And the Bible said that he couldn't do many miracles. Was his power limited? Yes. In a way. He could do the miracles he wanted. But when Jesus was here on earth, he was acting as a person. He was God. He was born as a person. And he was kind of hindered by their lack of honor. 
Because they were not seeing him as Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the one that does miracles, but Jesus, the son of Joseph. We know him. He grew up here. Who does he think he is? Now, I'm going to ask uh, now a special performance. And uh, I'd like to hear the violin. I'm sorry to the French speaking people, you've lost your translator. <laughs> but I'd like to share, as I conclude, I'd like to share this uh, little story. It's a true story. And this happened two years ago in Washington, D.C. And there's this man that uh, took his place downtown Washington against the wall and he pulled a violin from a case and began to play. And for the performance, he decided to play six uh, selections from Bach. And there was several, th several thousand people that, that were passing by and heard him play. And some stopped and heard briefly and moved away. Some children will stop and the parents will pull their hands. And as he was playing out of sympathy, some people started to give money, you know, sympathy money. And uh, maybe it was just the children's curiosity that caused them to stop. But I think that some realized that something greater was happening. Because the beggar that was playing the violin was the world-renowned Joshua Bell, the biggest violinist, musician. And the instrument he took from the, the case to play it's valued at 3.5 million dollars. The night before, 48 hours before, he packed the Boston, the Boston Theater with an average price per ticket at the back above a hundred dollars and at the front several thousand dollars to hear him play. And today he gave a concert in the street, nobody cared. But he got some money. He got $32. After one hour, most by sympathy. At the end, there was no applause. There was no standing ovation. There was not anyone asking for more. No one acknowledged that the violin was playing and it was the hand of a master. At the end, the violin got back into the case. He packed grabbed the coins, nobody noticed. They were unaware. And my guess is that things like this are happening everywhere. That greatness and grandeur are present. And we're just unaware of greatness and grandeur. My guess is that this may happen also here, in your local church, places where you go. You have greatness there and you just ignore it. And my challenge today with this message is not to bring honor to people, though we owe honor to one another, but we need to bring honor and glory to God. You can be to the service and just ignore that God is right here. God is right here. And God is using me and other people to talk to your heart. And God wants to tell you, acknowledge grandeur. Acknowledge God's presence. Don't just come by and just let it, let it go. See this subject of honor. We can be so unaware of greatness that the Holy Spirit right now is speaking to you. And you might just be ignoring God and just say, well, these pastors want to bring us to a state of emotion in order to do things. <coughs> this is not about emotion. This is about greatness. We have great people here. I mean, we have school principals. Thank you so much. Let's give a hand the applause for them. By the way, she's the next Joshua Bell. <laughs> Not kidding. Sometimes we're in the presence of greatness and we despise, we ignore them.
I happened to play soccer with one of the greatest soccer players that made millions of dollars. And I played with him when, and when he was a kid and I thought I was better than him. <laughs> Maybe you're sitting there and you think, I'm better than this guy. I could do a better job preaching. This is not about people. It's about the greatness of our Lord. Amen. Be aware of greatness. The last thing, because there's a concept in our society, we don't honor people. Some, sometimes, husbands don't honor their wives. They don't even notice their wives. And then this is that wedding party that I was telling. And another guy asked her to dance. And this guy treated her so well, and she's smiling at this other guy. And suddenly, you wake up and say, hey! She's smiling at that guy. Question is, are you honoring her? Jealousy can sometimes trigger certain feelings that are not necessarily all evil. Because that jealousy can cause that man to say, hey, I need to do something better for my wife. Now she's looking at this other guy. Do you know the Holy Spirit is jealous? Do you know He can be jealous of you? And you know when the Holy Spirit is jealous, it's not because the Holy Spirit is a selfish person because He is God Almighty. But when He's jealous is when you're giving the honor that God deserves to football and to hockey and to all these other things that you like doing. But you neglect your God. And you say, worship is of no importance. I can worship here or at home. Same thing. What if God, with the internet, why should I go to church? I can, you know, choose a preacher. And you have a list of preachers. Or the radio, or whatever. But you see, what the radio and those preachers will not do, it's what is, what's happening here today, which is a face-to-face -face conversation. And I'm not here to criticize or to rebuke, but I'm here to tell you, you can be blessed if you just bring to God the honor that He deserves. Amen. Let us all stand. Praise God. Let's give that applause to the Lord. Come on. Let's give that applause to the Lord.